in a combination using a combination of great art, great tech, and a financial model that ultimately has a capacity to be self-sustaining. For many disruptors like these, whether creative enterprises or innovation projects reimagining institutions from the inside, it's often really difficult to get a hold of dedicated, tailored support, which is why this Createch program is such a unique opportunity. So rather than providing an off-the-shelf course, this program is designed to deliver specific interventions built around your current needs, ways in which we can work with you directly to turbocharge your innovation project. For example, it may be that ultimately you're looking for introductions to potential investors or partners and collaborators who can help your idea grow more quickly. You may need expert advice or strategic reviews to identify challenges and opportunities or support in planning for investment or planning your technical or product roadmap. You may need strategic support on how your innovation can respond to and benefit from emerging trends or advice around how to communicate your idea to the general public for maximum impact. So this creative program will work with you to address questions like this for your innovation project, funding 20 hours of consultancy support tailored to your specific challenges. The main element of the programme takes place between mid-August and mid-November, where myself and Peter will be working intensively with a cohort of eight teams. Initially, we'll spend some time getting a deeper understanding of your current situation, helping to diagnose exactly where the support of this programme can make the biggest difference to the success of your project. Then, following that diagnosis, we'll develop some strategic recommendations with you, making it clear how best to proceed. And then we move on to delivery, working with you to deliver those recommendations, making the introductions, crafting the strategies, honing the model. In addition to this bespoke consulting, you'll become part of a unique peer community made up of Australia's leading creative innovators. You'll meet each other online at our orientation workshop in August, and we'll encourage you to share notes and progress throughout the program. You'll also be sent a treasure trove of digital resources from Remix. We'll also get the full cohort along to attend Remix Summit's Perth in, on the 14th and 15th of September later this year to spend time with the rest of the group, as well as networking with the wider speakers and delegates attending Remix. Finally, your innovation project will be promoted globally to the special, in the special Remix Digital Showcase, where you'll be invited to give a 15 minute presentation introducing your work. The showcase will be promoted by both Remix and the Australia Council to help grow the audience for it. So who exactly are we looking for and who could benefit from this type of support? I'm gonna hand over to my co-founder, Peter Tullin, to talk you through a few examples of the types of innovation projects we're looking for. Thanks, Simon. Um, hi, and it's, yeah, it's great to see so many of you here uh, joining us today. Um, I'm Peter. Um, uh, I want to just uh, acknowledge that I'm speaking today from um, Wadarong uh, country, which is uh, I'm, I'm based over in um, Geelong in Victoria, uh, and pay uh, my respects to any uh, elders past, present uh, and emerging. Um, what I wanted to do with, with my section really is, uh, as Simon mentioned, this is a really broad program. Um, when you think about what can be um, examples of enterprise and entrepreneurship uh, in the digital space that's building new audiences and income streams, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot that it can be. Um, so I wanted to spend sort of 10, 15 minutes um, absolutely kind of racing through a series of examples of the kind of things um, that might be supported in this program through the um, consultancy. Uh, if you don't see something on there that might um, you know, trigger uh, you in terms of the sorts of things that you've got in mind. Don't don't worry. But I think hopefully what this will show is just how how diverse this this program can be. So uh, I'm just going to share my screen, and then we'll we'll work through the examples. Okay. Okay. So hopefully everybody can um, see the slides. Um, uh, so the first one I'm going to talk about this this one. Uh, just because I'm going to talk about it, just because I know it quite intimately, because I'm an investor and advisor, is um, arts pay. So this is a great example, um, and I think this is what all of the examples have in common, and that they've started from very humble roots, from nothing, just an idea, 
Um, but it's it's a great example of a group of creative entrepreneurs, um, including a, an artist who've spotted a gap to do something that has um, real impact and can really change the way that we fund the arts. So, so arts pay at a, at a top level is a very simple idea, but it's also an idea which is getting very big very quickly, which is something that potentially we're looking for with, with the program. So it started in the pandemic. Um, the group of three um, founders basically looked at uh, obviously the challenges that were facing the arts during that time, you know, people losing their, their work, their, their, their gigs and really being under pressure and and thought, is there a big idea that we can come up with that would really um, help to raise new funds, generate new income for creatives, particularly that kind of grassroots um, area of the sector that had been particularly disproportionately um, affected. So they came up with the idea of, of arts pay. And what's clever about arts pay was, um, even though the, 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 the team are very entrepreneurial, they've got knowledge of technology, they didn't build the technology themselves they identified that they could use a payment um, processing solution. And rather than giving um, all the money to say the big banks or to Silicon Valley or PayPal's and you know, uh, Westpac's and kind of others, they used that technology, but with a twist. Um, so in the case of ArtsPay, if you're a, a shop or an art gallery and you use the ArtsPay payment solution to um, take payments for what somebody might buy at a a bar or a ticket or whatever that might be, rather than a kind of 100% of that profit going to, you know, one of those players that I've just mentioned, 50% of that payment processing fee um, goes into a new foundation that's been set up to support the arts. Um, so ArtsPay have been running for um, about a year now, and they're up to over 100 different organizations that are using um, that service. So it's growing really quickly. It's proving to be a kind of sustainable idea. Um, and the um, first round of um, grants uh, has just been announced through the foundation as well. So that's ArtsPay. Uh, the second one is um, looking at kind of NFTs. You know, this is a, a very kind of topical area. Um, lots of kind of commentary about what's happening in this space. It's a bit of a wild west, absolutely. Um, but I've pulled out one example that I quite like because I think, again, it's a, it's an example of um, you know, how you can um, uh, engage with NFTs, potentially, say, as a cultural institution or as a kind of digital artist. Um, so, so Iconic Moments is a platform which is designed to help cultural institutions to step into this space. Um, and what they do is uh, they, they basically create um, NFTs. Um, they handhold those cultural institutions through the process. They pair them up with kind of interesting digital artists. They help them to unlock the things that exist in their collections and their archives that might be interesting to transform into an NFT. And then they provide um, a bit like kind of culture label that was referred to earlier as a kind of curated, trusted kind of marketplace to buy art. They provide a lot of kind of trust and curation through the partners that they're working with. So one of their partners, for example, is the, um, uh, the White House. Um, the uh, image you can see on the kind of right-hand side is a, a reimagining of a painting and by an artist called um, Alma Thomas, who was the first African-American uh, woman to have her art featured um, in the White House. And um, so that's kind of an interesting example in the NFT space. Um, audio, audio is a kind of an interesting uh, technology. This is a good example of both um, something that uses technology for a physical experience, but also um, an at-home at experience. So Darkfield, who are actually in Australia, they have a series of shows happening in Sydney by the Powerhouse um, museum at the moment and um, they produce these amazing um uh, audio shows using immersive binaural uh, recorded audio um where you put your headphones on and you sit in one of these shipping containers which is then on the inside is magically transformed into a plane or a seance they've got these different environments you then sit through this um uh, show um, and it's a kind of ticketed experiences they've had over two hundred fifty thousand people have bought a, a kind of ticket for these experiences but they've also um, generated an online version that you can do at home. Um, I remember doing this um, during the, the pandemic. Um, it's a really kind of powerful piece of uh, audio um, theatre. And because of the recording with the binaural audio, um, you know, particularly with kind of new kind of spatial headphones like, you know, Apple AirPods and things, you really get the sense that it's all happening around you. There's a point where 
and uh, it's alluded to that somebody kind of touches you on the shoulder and it's like you're almost kind of feeling it, you know, such as the, as the power of the kind of the audio um, effects. So I think they're a kind of an interesting example of an innovator in the audio space, but have also provided a model for uh, an in-person experience, but also an at-home experience. But what they've also done is, you know, you don't have to have the same experience in person at home. So they cleverly devised the plot for the at-home experience to make use of everyday objects. So they might say, sit in a kitchen, so they can then talk about things that make sense in the kind of context of your own home or in a public space or something like that. Um, streaming is a kind of big one. I won't talk too much about this, but it tends to fall into kind of different categories. And again, I think this is a great example of thinking about different formats that you wouldn't necessarily do in a kind of physical space. So um, there are players all around the world in terms of different cultural institutions that are producing their own content for streaming purposes. So uh, Acme in Australia is an example of that with their Cinema 3 initiative or uh, the BFI in the UK or the National Theatre. And the challenge of things like the National Theatre or um, you know, Shakespeare Globe is how do you capture theatre for an online audience and not necessarily um, you know, simply kind of stream it um, in a sort of standardised form. Um, then there are kind of players that are sort of taking a whole genre. So they might take theatre or, or um, independent um, film, for example, and produce a kind of model um, that captures all of the different players in that space and kind of aggregates it for an audience that's just interested um, in theatre, for example. Um, so digital theatre is, is a good example of, of, of that. Um, and then you've got kind of broader players that kind of marquee TV who are saying we are a streaming platform just for the arts, you know, right through to obviously the more generic um, players that are covering everything like a kind of Netflix. So uh, lots happening in that space. Um, I think there's something interesting about kind of diving into a particular kind of um, niche. An example is uh, History Hit. Um, uh, uh, Dan Snow is a well-known uh, uh, sort of TV history presenter in the UK. He'd always worked for you know people like the BBC. Um, he realised that as he had a significant kind of social following uh, and a kind of personal brand, so he decided that he was going to create his own kind of history channel. Um, it's a really clever model. It's a kind of like Netflix for history is probably the best way to describe it. But it's been really driven by the um, growth in podcasts. Um, so he has a kind of podcast which now around a kind of million um, uh, people a week plus kind of listen to. Um, and that's then translated into about 100,000 kind of paying subscribers. So that's certainly not the size of something like Netflix, of course, but it shows you um, how if you can find a free channel like his podcast, you can then convert a certain number of those into people that are interested in that content. Um, that then creates a kind of sustainable business. And um, hybrids are really kind of big one. We started to talk about this with, with Darkfield. And um, this is the kind of War of the Worlds immersive experience in uh, London. It's been running for uh, four or five years now. Uses a lot of creative technologies like um, uh, virtual reality, uh, uh, motion, even things like technologies around sense to kind of bring alive these kind of theatrical um, spaces that tell the, the, the War of the Worlds uh, story. And the reason I mention them is because they run a, a commercially successful business as creative entrepreneurs, but they've actually recently teamed up with um, Historic Royal Palaces, who run the uh, Tower of London. And together they've teamed up, both bringing their respective kind of skills and ideas and insights to the table. So real kind of co-creation of a, a project between a creative entrepreneur and a cultural organization, um, where they've done an immersive version of the um, Guy Fawkes um, gunfighter plot. I'm going to keep racing through so we just keep get through the rest of the uh, the examples. Um, another example in Australia, and, and again, just uh, apologies for a bit of bias here and a bit of conflict of interest because I sit on the board of Melbourne Museum, but we've recently developed a really interesting project called um, Chiama. And this is an immersive um, projection experience um, which looks at the natural world through the lens of first peoples and the scientists that are based um, at the museum. But it's a really interesting model because it integrates objects from our collection. It uses technologies like projection, but also kind of interaction. Um, so um, audiences can actually interact with the, um, the digital components of the exhibition as well. Um, 
Then there's lots of opportunities, you know, obviously using kind of mobile. So this is a great example in Melbourne by True Crime Games. They tell historical stories using um, augmented uh, reality apps, um, where again, you just basically buy and um, buy the app in order to access the game. And you can transform the streets of Melbourne into a historical uh, murder mystery. Um, then there are examples that are, are taking things like that um, experience online in a totally new way that are working with sponsors to do that. Um, so Intel and Epic Games, Epic are the people behind things like Unreal Engine, which is used for games like Fortnite, teamed up with the Royal Shakespeare Company, and they produced this kind of live online um, performance funded by those um, commercial partners. Um, uh, another area that I wanted to talk about really briefly is uh, just the huge growth in the creator economy. We think there's lots of scope for people to get involved in the program in this area. Um, so there was a time where, um, you know, while there were lots of creators, they didn't make much money because they were relying on a you know clip of an advert from a, a YouTube or a, a big streaming uh, or a content platform like that. And that wasn't really enough to turn it into a kind of a real job. But with the advent of platforms like Patreon, um, you're suddenly getting the rise of what they call the sort of creator middle class. Um, and that means people can, um, no matter how niche their subject area, how small their number of followers, potentially as long as those followers want to pay a recurring subscription to access their content, then people can create businesses out of this. And some of them are doing um, pretty well. So um, Patreon have already paid out about $2 billion US dollars to creators. Over 200,000 creators are using Patreon. Again, it's a very kind of broad church. Um, you know, it's everything from people doing stuff in gaming to the visual arts. Um, but there's some great examples of where um, people are building kind of big followings through these platforms, particularly using um, platforms like TikTok, obviously a bit of a kind of controversy around that particular platform. But there's some really interesting things happening in the art space. So you've got people like um, Mary McGilvery here um, who uh, does these really interesting kind of TikToks um, around um, um, artworks, art movements. Um, she built her following up from zero to uh, around about 400,000 followers and kind of no time at all. She works with lots of cultural institutions now, like the State Library in Victoria. I worked on a project with her or the, the NGV um, and has built a business which is about um, really sort of um, showcasing collections and stories in new ways, you know, using TikTok. Um, some of them have kind of really exploded to show you where an online uh, business can go into kind of the offline space. So um, you've got people like RMC here, which is the guy on the right uh, with the Space Invaders jumper. Um, he is a kind of um, computer game uh, historian. Um, he interviews a lot of the kind of big names around the uh, history of video games, you know, the kind of people who created Atari and sort of things like that. Um, so he kind of covers stories that are covered by, say, institutions like um, Acme as part of their remit or the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley or Bletchley Park um, of the kind of code breakers Enigma fame in the UK or the National Video Game Museum. Now, these organizations have hundreds of thousands of visitors, you know, collectively, um, you know, um, over two million visitors between them. But in the online space, somebody like RMC or, or Neil is his real name can compete with them in terms of numbers of subscribers, viewers, but they're also heavily engaged. What, what he has is people that come back every time he releases uh, a video. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're consuming it in the same way they, they, they would do um, uh, other forms of media that they would go to on a kind of regular basis. So he's got this really high level engagement. So he uses that engagement to then use platforms like Kickstarter and Patreon and others to then generate an income. He's been so successful releasing you know, books on computer game history and products that he's now gone full circle. He's actually launched his own kind of like a museum slash clubhouse. You wouldn't call it fully a museum in this um, uh, mill that he's renovated um, in a rural part of uh, England. So it's interesting. Somebody started kind of online, has got such a committed, loyal following. He's now opening a kind of physical space to connect with his community and audience. Um, similar example, only a couple more just to kind of run through now, is again using platforms like kind of Kickstarter and Indiegogo is a um, mini museum. This is kind of Hans Fex. Um, he's built a multi-million dollar business by um, tapping into people's kind of passion for collecting. Um, so 
every so often he releases these kind of mini museums, which are kind of very small pieces of objects. This is probably anathema to anybody who's uh, listening on museums. So he will find something like a Steve Jobs turtleneck or a piece of a, uh, an Apollo spacecraft, and he will turn them into tiny little objects so that people can then buy these kind of collections, can own a little bit of the, um, the story in their homes. Uh, and again, he's going back to the same people time and time again. And using a platform like Kickstarter, he can take his concept global. So he's got over 40,000 customers um, in 120 different countries. Um, online learning, I think this is a big space. Um, you've got the, the big players like kind of MoMA that are in this area that are offering kind of um, online courses. And, and, and their model is um, you know, relatively low um, price to kind of access that kind of content using um, platforms like Coursera. You can offer a course for kind of free. Um, and then people can pay for certificate certification or if they pay as a subscriber to lots of content, you get your share of that um, pot of money. Um, some people are charging quite high amounts, you know, Design Museum, interestingly, charging, you know, 200 pounds or uh, converted to probably, you know, closer to 400 Australian dollars um, where they're offering, you know, really in-depth kind of online e-learning and content, which is kind of really interesting. And again, trading off the fact that they're a kind of trusted brand. Um, and then people obviously also using platforms like kind of Airbnb or Amazon Explore. Um, you know, these are big tech platforms that have really got into the kind of cultural space over the last years. But what they're allowing is individual experience providers to leverage their huge audience to come up with really innovative um, online experiences um, literally kind of anywhere in the world. So, look, just a few examples. There's lots more that we can go through. Um, if you're interested in this space, we have lots of and um, free talks about similar kind of things on the, the Remix platform, which is just remixsummits.com. Um, and then uh, it, was, it was mentioned by Katie uh, in a scarily uh, less than two weeks, we have um, about 60 or so speakers talking about all kinds of different examples of cultural and creative entrepreneurship um, in Sydney at the Australian Maritime Museum. So I will stop there and um, yeah, hand back to Katie. Thanks, Peter. Um, thank you for running through all those interesting examples. Now uh, I am just going to talk a little bit about some of the application uh, requirements. So um, what, what you'll need to do to apply. So if Peter, if you wouldn't mind, um, if you stop sharing your screen and I'll just, uh, I'll just share um, the, the main uh, page for our program page for Create Tech, which you've probably all already seen um, because you would have had to register here. So firstly, um, let's just talk through a bit about um, eligibility for the program. So if we have a look here, So what we're um, we're looking for applicants who we're it's it's reasonably open here, right? So we're wanting to hear from arts aligned, creative industries, organisations, groups, and individuals. So um, that's you know that's fairly broad there. So hopefully you see yourself there. We're seeking creative businesses, organisations, and individuals based in Australia. And then there's two conditions that we have. So we want to see some kind of proven track record with further potential for growth and or impact. So what we mean by this is that either one of your projects or your sole project or your organisation is getting some traction. So you can point to its positive reception and early growth um, in a particular area. So now you're ready to grow it to the next level, for example, through investment, introductions, strategic planning, or advanced tech support. Excuse me, I thought it turned that off. Um, the second um, requirement is that it needs to be a digital or hybrid innovation that reimagines how the arts are experienced or supported. So it needs to be a, uh, a fully digital or, or hybrid project. So we're using this word disruptor. You're a disruptor, your organization's a disruptor um, with an ability to imagine new opportunities for the arts sector, 
uh, whether fully digital or hybrid. And innovations can come from the use of technology, for example, immersive experiences using projection, free roam VR, innovations offering new or improved digital access to culture. Um, and uh, obviously, Peter's given you some great examples of, you know, the kinds of things that um, the kinds of projects we might be interested to support. Um, we're open to digital innovations that directly support the arts but don't have a creative end product. For example, new models for creative retail funding or networks. Um, Peter or Simon, would you like to say anything more there about um, about the eligibility of people that that we would hope to come into the program? Um, I, th I think the most important thing is that the best ideas will be very unexpected. So we'd encourage everybody to apply with whatever you think might be sort of vaguely fitting those eligibility criteria. And I think the chances are that if it's if it's something that um, you feel is in a really interesting space, it's something that's already starting to get traction, like we said, or it's using your expertise in a particular subsector of the creative industries, or it's using your expertise around technology or indeed your business models. And you see a real kind of new opportunity and a new way of, of engaging with the arts and engaging with new audiences. We definitely, definitely encourage you to apply and we'd really like to see a very broad spectrum of applications across across the different types of organizations and enterprises yeah and i probably add to that whether it's kind of um you know a, a, an individual a small organization right through to a kind of big organization um uh you know it's it, it would be good for us to have a kind of real um range and and and, and often, as you've probably seen from some of the examples, you know, particularly in like the creator economy, like an individual can have a really disproportionate impact um, in the digital space. As Simon says, if they have the right idea, they're using the, um, you know, the, the, the right kind of innovations and, and technology. And I think the other thing I would say, it's getting that that balance between, you know, it doesn't have to be something which is, um, has like, you know, off the chart kind of growth potential that could you know, be like an arts pay that generates millions and millions of dollars for, for the arts. It can be something which simply makes creative practice sustainable at one end to something at the other end, which might be, you know, more like an arts pay where if it really caught fire, you know, could sort of change the world sort of thing. Um, so I think this, again, we're, we're looking for a range of um, participants in this program. And also the great thing is you get that right mix in the cohort as you also benefit from each other as much as you do from the input that, you know, me, Simon, and other people that can give you through the program. And uh, I think it's also worth um, highlighting that some of the members of the cohort will be creative enterprises or creative individuals um, that are sort of more in the for-profit space around this. Some may be nonprofit institutions, so it might be a, a, a department or a group of people within an organization. You might be a change maker within a larger institution that's looking to remodel the way in which the, the institution is working or how it's approaching a particular product within the institution. And we, we're very, very open to whether it's a kind of for profit, nonprofit, whether it's a, an enterprise, whether it's an institution. I think the, the key thing is the objective, which is new audiences, new revenue streams, new ways of working and experience in the arts generally. Um, and I think the, the final sort of thing I'd, I'd mention on this is one of the most, one of the biggest sort of um, identifiers of success is the focus that we're able to see on a project. So I think one of the key, key things is that whether it's within an organization or whether it's a product line within an enterprise or whether it's a whole enterprise, one of the most important things for us is there are people that are really focused on driving this through to completion. They're able to really sort of put the time and work and effort and focus into seeing it through. And I think that's always one of the biggest challenges with programs like this, um, generally around whether it's courses, whether it's accelerators, incubators, whatever the model, it really needs that 100% focus on these kind of things to get the most out of both the program and the enterprise itself. So we'd really encourage you to have a, a really kind of clear focus, whether that's a person within your team or whether it's the whole organization. I think that level of focus is something we'll be looking really closely for. 
Great, thank you. Um, one other important uh, factor in applying is that you must be available to travel to Perth to attend the Remix Summit uh, in person from the 14th to the 15th of September uh, later this year. So that's a, that's a really key part of the program. Okay, um, so let's just talk through very briefly how to apply um, and then, you know, once you get to that point, if you have any questions, you can also get back in touch. But just briefly, um, you'll need to answer the following questions. You'll give us your project title. You'll give us your project description. Um, also, I guess here, if you have uh, an organisation that is um, that ha that is kind of building a business model that has um, uh, perhaps a couple of projects, maybe you can describe, um, you know, more than one, um, how your project or projects are getting traction, describe how you've had a positive reception and early growth and why this opportunity is timely in terms of supporting the scaling of the project. So then describe how you've been a disruptor with an ability to imagine new opportunities for the art sector, whether fully digital or hybrid and then describe the potential impact of your project on the creative sector. Anything else you'd like to add, Peter or Simon there? Really straightforward. Um, then the application process, uh, the applications are now open and you need to apply on the Australia Council's application management system. Closing date is the 4th of July, 3 p.m. deadline. So just make sure that you remember that. It's not quite the end of the day. Um, and also just an important note, you do need to be registered in our application management system a minimum of two business days prior to the closing date. Um, so just remember, even, you know, if you go in today um, and just register, if your organisation is not already registered um, in the Australia Council's application management system, even if you just do that registration part today, even if you don't put in an application later, that's fine, but it's just good to remember to register. Um, applicants will be notified of the outcome uh, approximately a month after the closing date. And if I just scroll back up here, you'll see um, just the apply now button here. Right. So there's the key dates um, and there's the apply now button, which will take you through to the application management system. OK, uh, well, that's all the um, basics about the uh, application process. So now I'd like to open it up for Q&A so we can have a look um, at any questions that have already been asked. And then um, we can also um, you, you can feel free to also uh, ask us questions. So I'll just stop sharing. So we have, let's go back and see. So I think David Clarkson has the first question. We're a small arts company uh, working in the digital and theatre space. We have two or three areas of research, innovation in AR, 3D projection and live theatre experiences. For this application, can we put in a couple of our ideas or would you prefer just one idea? So that's a good question. Peter and Simon, yeah. do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, David Tese might want to talk to it in a bit more detail, but I mean, I guess if there's there's one area that, to, to Simon's point, you feel there's definitely going to be more of a focus for your organisation, then, you know, might might make sense to, um, you know, sort of apply around that area because then you you know it's going to be the area that you're going to be spending kind of most um, time on. Um, uh, otherwise, there isn't necessarily a problem with with a, a applying with um, two ideas if it's two areas that you've, you've got a kind of genuine track record or that you're you're kind of working in. That one of the main things for us is the the idea itself is definitely only one part of the application. We're also looking to identify the the kind of talent um, you know within the, the teams, which I think is kind of really important. It's about who who makes the most sense in, in a cohort like this because you go okay, well. 
that team, that individual, that organization have, have really got the potential to make this idea happen. Because often the idea changes as a result of this process anyway. You know, I don't know whether Simon, you had anything to add to that. No, I, I agree. I think I think it's like the getting the balance. And if you're if if you particularly lean towards one of the ideas, go with that one. If not, then happy to sort of have multiple ideas, just as long as you'd be happy to then dedicate. 100% to one or the other rather than sort of spreading your time between them. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say some of these ideas inevitably use kind of multiple technologies anyway. I think looking at David's, if it's around something like live theatre, there might be more than one technology that's involved in a, in a project anyway. All right. So um, now we have Jamie. Um... As a collaborative project, I'm curious about if the help is for one person in the team or will you communicate, give access to digital for more than one member? Uh, also with Perth, is there funding to get someone to Perth, just one member of the team? Okay, good question. Um, do you want to sort of uh, talk to the first the yeah. first section, Peter or Simon? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to take that one. I think it's um it's always great to get the full team involved or get as the kind of key stakeholders within the team involved with this. And um it tends to work best with um depending on how big the team is, obviously, but around about sort of two to four people is probably the, the kind of the perfect number. Um and we'd we'd be very, very keen to get as the kind of the key people involved. Because a big part of this is going to be the brainstorm and it's going to be the discussion. It's going to be sort of um, working through a lot of the challenges together. And I think that that can then really get the most out of the mentoring support and the, the consulting support when we, when we can work and bounce off each other through that process. So it definitely encourages many members of the team to get involved as, as is feasible. And then in terms of the funding, um... Yes, there will be um, funding to help with travel to, to Perth for the Remix Summit. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what the limitations on that may be for um, numbers of people. Uh, but yes, there, there will be support there for the travel. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, uh, Kristen. So yeah, yes, you can, you can, um, you can't actually download the application form. You can, it's sort of interactive. So um, you can, if you log on to the application management system, if you don't already have uh, an account um, with Osco's application management system, you'll need to create one, which is pretty straightforward. And then um, you can, um, what you can do is work your way through the questions um, I think you you might sometimes need to um, answer some things in order to move on to the next uh, the next part of the form, but you can um, you can just do that as a dummy, and then you just don't click submit until you you can then you can come back and and change anything you want to as long as you haven't clicked submit. So hopefully that is clear. Um, Tanil, you have a question you'd like to ask? Would yeah, you um, like to I couldn't put it into too yeah. much short text. So um, I represent an organisation in the Northern Territory called the Geek Culture Collective. We essentially represent people that would apply for this but don't have their own ABNs. Is there opportunity within this to apply for the consultancy on behalf of a group of people and then manage it um, in, that, in that way so that a lot of the different little community groups get um, access to this consultancy? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I guess, um, I guess it would ultimately the application would need to come from a single group with a, with a project. Focus. And because we could have a project that involves all of the community groups, for example. So mm. the project might be how we make the Geek Culture Collective an online portal that can be accessed from these smaller user groups and then how do we expand that across Australia because from our understanding we are one of the first organizations in the NFP space to actually bring these tiny little geek groups together and I'm talking you know the 20 people playing Warhammer on a Thursday every week 
um, you know, it's very small, certain niches of arts and anime creatives, um, the artists that are going into uh, pop culture conventions, that sort of thing. We represent such a broad spectrum that we could probably run one of these projects that they bring in, but we would need to do that background work in the next sort of three to four weeks to find out which idea we would support the most. Is that potentially something that could work? Uh, yeah, um, do you want to, yeah, do you want to, I can sort yeah, of think about it for I think, I think, I think to get the most out of the program, I, I, I think the, the kind of the short answer is yes, there would be ways of making it work. And it might be in those first few weeks, we kind of work with you to identify the best way of then shaping the rest of the program. And I, that's very much the kind of the model that we'd be kind of keen to sort of collaboratively sort of develop how best to, to kind of work with you. Um, the the kind of main thing for us is having a, a a very clear lead on this though, so making sure that it's that there isn't the opportunity for people to pass the book for somebody else to have done the homework yes. from last week and so on. So when you wrote one hundred percent focus, I was like, okay, we need yeah. <laughs> we need a clear person, but I just don't know. Yeah, who that I, would I be. think that's that's yeah. probably the main thing, and then mm. the the kind of the question around how it's structured, how we sort of work with different sort of groups. I think we can work through all those kind of things when we get into the detail of it. But as long as it's a strong enough kind of group and background and and the idea, et cetera, I think that would that would be something we'd be really keen to hear about. Yep. Thank you. That's answered my question for now. Right. Okay. Uh, well, that's all the questions that we've got in the chat. So would anyone else like to ask a question now. We've already got some collaboration going on in the chat. Which is yeah, good. <laughs> got some networking happening, which is great. Uh, I guess, Tanil, if, if you have any more specific questions about um, the application and auspicing, that's something that you can contact me about. Um, you know, as a, so that, you know, there's a broad answer there, but then if you wind up getting into the nitty gritty and need to um, more specifics about auspicing, then just, sure. just let me know. <laughs> so that's one of the pieces that we do. We auspice other organisations that don't have the ability to apply for this grant. So potentially we might just end up doing a bit of a marketing push and then mm be that channel for them and they might have yeah. an idea and I'll be able to having sat in on this conversation I've written down all the ideas that Peter went through and you know we'll reach out to our networks and make sure that they know they've got support if they want it so yeah um yeah. I'll look forward to chatting to Jamie's that's exciting yeah great great uh anyone else have any other questions that they either want to um you can turn on your mic or type in the chat uh, yeah, um, thanks, Katie. Grant, Hi, Grant, Grant here. Hi. Look, I, I just wanted, and I'm sure this would be um, explained further down the track, but I just wondered how is the 20 hours shaped? Is there any sort of uh, process or is it uh, self perpetuating? It's um, it's a good question. And the, the, the main sort of focus for us, um, the, the 20 hours is actually just the face-to-face -face time. There's a lot of other kind of research and development time in the background on top of that as well. Um, so, it's, so for us, that face-to-face -face time is really sort of split into that initial stage of diagnostics, really getting under the, under the bonnet of your enterprise, your idea, your organization, and really understanding where these interventions can make the most difference. And I think that that first stage will probably take the first sort of two to three weeks to really sort of do a, a detailed kind of diagnostics on, on where things are at, where the, the gaps are, where the opportunities are. And then after that, the, the bulk of the program then moves into, well, the, the next stage is then recommendations. And then the next stage after that is delivery. And the bulk of the program is the delivery factor. So when we get into delivery, that's really kind of working with you around um, whether it's introductions or whether it's strategy or whether it's some of the, the kind of the marketing elements or whatever it may be, that's really the kind of the, the bulk of the time. So I think the once we've got 
the, the obviously it kind of depends on the individual projects and for some that might be more of an ideation stage where we're sort of working with you around potential ideas how to hone existing ideas or come up with new ones it might be in-depth kind of strategy development and really looking at some of the the detail of implementation or strategy strategic planning at that stage or it might be working with you to assemble lists of potential approaches or honing a, a pitch or honing a an ability to to sort of approach different types of communications whether that's investors or whether it's other types of stakeholders or whether it's uh, indeed the general public so it is very very tailored to each individual team but at the same time it broadly follows that kind of logic between the diagnostics the recommendations and then the delivery and obviously that's that's just one part of it on top of that there's all the kind of stuff around the cohort and the, the kind of the peer learning between different members of, of the cohort community and also the work we're doing around the digital showcase where it gives that kind of opportunity to, to sort of celebrate what you're doing internationally as well. Does that answer Thanks. your question? Yes, it does. Thank you, Simon. I'm just, actually just uh, uh, continuing the um, the thought of the uh, the Perth um, conference. I can see that it's there for networking opportunities and um, other things, but is is there anything other than than that i noticed that the pitch is a digital pitch worldwide so is that um recorded at the conference and then used or how does the um the conference and the global pitch work yeah there's do you want me to talk to that yeah yeah there's yeah there's there's a couple of different ways that we're thinking about that because there's uh there's obviously some logistics with the group that's mm. potentially kind of distributed um across australia uh one option is that we look at making that an online uh process because potentially people might not be at the point that they're ready to record for example around the the, the perth event um or we find a way of kind of, um, we're, we're having some conversation around to partners where potentially you could do that kind of locally. So that's the bit that we'll probably only know exactly when you're going to record that and how you're going to record that depending on the nature of the group, where the group's from. So we've probably got about two or three different strategies about sure. how we're going to do that. But if, you know, uh, you know, the, it, it, it is literally going to depend on the kind of geography, actually, you know. The, the two the two key things for us one is around um, consistency we want to make sure that all of the different elements of the digital showcase are very high quality so we'll, we'll ensure that you've got the right support to to deliver a, a great piece of content for that showcase mm -hmm. and the second bit is also to allow for a lot of creative freedom as well so we don't want to be too constrictive around the particular format and um, mm -hmm. when we did the reboot conference during covid we had about 20 global speakers a lot from the us and it was really interesting seeing how they all approach the same challenge of a 10, 15 minute talk. Mm -hmm. And it was the diversity of approaches was actually one of the kind of the key highlights of it. So we want to encourage different creative ways of, of using that time. So, so it's, we'll be trying to get the balance right between the kind of creative freedom, but also having that kind of polish to it. So we'll be working with you quite intensively on, on developing that particular aspect of it. Yeah, and the things that you would want to tick off within a showcase, a pitch like that as well, that, that that means that, you know, you've got a consistency across the ideas, but also for the people that are kind of consuming it, they can see that you've hit certain markers that they're going to be interested in if they're potential investors, funders, partners, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Look, just commenting, one thing I it really excites me and intrigues me is that you're utilising the cohort partnerships, um, you know, you we talk about the diversity which i'm sure you'll end up with but that that's a fantastic idea to actually create um conversations and feedback with uh, like-minded individuals i think that's that's something that is missed anyway that was a comment not a question thank yeah, you yeah thank you that's that's good to hear and and i think also more broadly within the remix network as well so there's the group and i think one of the, the the benefits of this is there's over a, a thousand people that now have been part of the the kind of global remix network as you know speakers mm -hmm. partners um, and and I think what we'll also be doing through that diagnostic phase as Simon said is you know if you've got an idea in e-commerce or it's in you know video creation on TikTok like who are the people that we can help you to reach to again help to kind of accelerate that idea by putting it in front of the right people whether that's again around further coaching mentoring partnership opportunities investment whatever that might be you know 
Right. Thank you, Simon. Peter? There's one more question in the chat um, from David just asking how many organisations or people will be successful. And I don't actually think that we have a number um, in our online information. Um, Peter and Simon, do, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, so we've got um, 10 as the, as, as the number that we're looking to kind of bring into the showcase. Yeah. Right. Uh, but that's a good pickup if we haven't put that on the uh the yeah program. i don't that's think very it's very helpful thank you i don't think it's Thanks, uh David. i don't think it's it mentions the cohort but it doesn't actually <laughs> mention the size of the cohort so we might add that in um thank you david uh any other final questions we just have a few more minutes I must mean it's all right. really clear then. Well, <laughs> hopefully so. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, if there are no um, no further questions, then I'll wrap it up. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we really look forward to receiving your applications. And, of course, feel free to get in touch. Um, we'll put the, uh, maybe just put the email in the chat again. It's there at the top and it's there on the application page. Great. There's the, um, there's the digital at Australia Council and, um, we'll be happy to answer any, uh, further questions. So thank you all for joining us today. Bye everyone. Yeah, thanks everyone. Bye.